I'm delighted to be here today. It's, it's a real treat and a real honor to talk a little bit about um, a, the cookbook I finished and also show a couple of the um, recipes from the book. Um, today we're taking a, an approach, we're doing um, some of the vegetarian recipes from the book. Um, one of them, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Jenga Love Hots. I'm not pronouncing it perfectly, but we've got, okay, we've got three people who know Jenga Love Hots. We're gonna be making those. Um, and then we're also going to be doing a very simple bean dish. I think of it as like um, the Armenian answer to refried beans. Um, and then we are gonna talk just a little bit too about how the book came about how I came to write a book with my two other co-authors, um, what Armenia is all about, what the food of Armenia is like, and we're just gonna have some fun. So with that, I will start on Jingle of Hots. Um, but first, um, I'll talk a little bit about just the background of the story. So my name, um, as you know, is Kate Leahy, and my co-authors are John Lee and Ara Zeta. Ara is an Armenian-American chef from LA, John is a Taiwanese-American uh, food photographer slash photojournalist. And the three of us formed this team to write this book together. And if anyone knows anything about um, cookbooks, a lot of times you just see one person's name on the book and they have their story. Um, here, it wasn't really about our individual stories. It was us forming a team to go to Armenia and really uncover um, stories that we felt needed to be written. Um, we we uh, joined up, um, John actually, I know him from the Burma Superstar cookbook. He uh, was the, the photographer for that book. And I kid you not, we are on a flight to Yangon. We have a lot of hours to kill. And he can't stop talking about Armenia. He's just like, you don't, dude. He says dude a lot. Like, dude, you don't understand. Like, Armenia, the food there is amazing. He's like, you want to show me some pictures? Uh, show me some pictures, John. Like, so. He opens up his laptop and we pass at least a couple of hours of the flight scrolling through images of um, the country of Armenia. And what's, what's really amazing is that he actually was one of those people who didn't know where Armenia was, um, was asked out of the blue from a friend of his who lives in the country to teach a food photography workshop to high school students through an organization called TUMO. And if anyone's heard of TUMO, um, Think of it as the world's best after school program. I mean, it's one of those things that any kid would want to go to TUMO. Um, you teach everything from animation to uh, computer programming to, to culinary arts to food photography. So John finds himself in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, and he's leading this group of Armenian um, high school kids around Yerevan, and they ended up touring the entire country and he's teaching them food photography, but he really feels like they're teaching him about Armenia. And he just really fell in love with the food, the people, and, and the story. And when we were talking about the, um, doing a book on Burmese food, he said, what about Armenia? And I said, well, I mean, these, photograph the, these photographs, and I don't know if anyone's peeked through the book, but the, the images are really captivating. I thought, this looks like a book. So let's, let's figure out how to make, you know, make something happen. But it wasn't right to just have John as um, a food photographer and me as a food writer. Um, I did have some history with um, Armenian food. I wrote my college thesis. You guys probably studied things that were much better for employment, but my college thesis was <laughs> cookbooks and Armenian American identity. Um, I had a really, I had some really good Armenian friends um, in high school and college and I always felt they talked about food more than any of my other friends. And so I wrote this thesis but then, you know, put it away for, for many years and it wasn't until John was talking to me about Armenia that I thought, oh yeah, this is a great idea but we need to find another person to, to complete our team. And um, Ara Zeta, grew up in an Armenian Egyptian household in LA. Um, and he had also been to Armenia to teach through the TUMO organization. And what was amazing for him is that he found out that the food he thought was Armenian was very different from the Armenian food in Armenia. So um, it was a learning experience for all of us. So with that said, a little backstory in the book, I'm gonna start on the food part. So get you guys a little hungry. Um, so, Jingle of Hots, and if I'm talking too much, please interrupt, ask questions. I can talk um, probably all day about Armenia, so I won't bore you. Um, Jingle of Hots, though, is really an interesting story. It's a very simple dough. The dough is just flour, water, a little bit of salt. There's no yeast. Made it about 20, 
25 minutes ago. I'm just going to divide it up into balls. And then this is a way, any kind of bread making, you can um, roll bread into a ball just by using the friction on a counter. So you have this nice little ball. I'm just going to put that aside, um, and then we will roll that out later. But then what I'm going to do in the meantime is talk about all the delicious greens. So has anybody ever eaten Jingle Pots? Where did you eat it? So, oh, so we have people here who have actually gone to the source. This is really scary for me. How am I going to live up to the expectations? Is, it, is Kate um, pronouncing it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, well, I have a funny story. So I was in um, Glendale in October, and it was before. Now Glendale has a place called Jingle of Hots that opened recently. But before it opened, I went to this other bakery that will make it if you ordered ahead. And so I called on the phone. I said, can you make me, you know, I need six Jingle of Hots for a book signing. What? Jingle of Hots. What? Jingle of Hots. Oh, you mean the Jingle of Bread. I said, you really couldn't get it from Jingle of? <laughs> like, really? Um, so what? I'll, actually, I'll bring over these greens just to show you um, how cool, oh, cool this is. So um, Jingle of Hots is really, Hots is bread in Armenia. So Jengalov is, there's, there's lots of theories where the name comes from, but it generally it kind of, um, it's, it's the idea is a lot of, um, of greens. Sometimes it translates to jungle or forest, but essentially it means um, locally in the Artsakh region, which is a complicated story that I might not get into till later, but um, this, is a, this is a dish from Artsakh. And, it's basically as many greens as you can fit in a bread. So we've got today, I'm super excited because the Google Garden, Google Garden has these beautiful sorrel leaves, which look like the kind of greens you find all over Artsakh in Armenia. Um, they're sour. They give it that nice acidic balance to the bread, which is really important for the flavor. Um, so what I'm going to do is just chop up some of them and then the Google team here has been so amazing chopping some stuff for me because chopping is pretty much like the hardest part about making Jingle Love Hots, that and filling the, the hot. So I'm just going to chop up some of the greens. Just to give you a sense of chopping, you kind of, I mean, ideally you want them nice and thin, but they're a little bigger. It's going to be perfectly fine. Um, what's really interesting about this from a culinary perspective is that you're using raw greens. Um, which I find kind of, I don't know if you feel this way, but a lot of times when you're using greens in a bread, you would think, oh, I've got to cook the greens, drain out all the liquid, right? And then, and then go ahead and make, make the greens. Um, but in this case, you actually want, you want all those, um, you want the freshness, and it's going to cook in the dough. So um, I'm just going to, this is cilantro. Um, as you can see, I'm chopping it with the stems. I think the cilantro stems add a really nice kind of flavor. Um, and let's see, we've got the spinach here. So the raw um, vegetables don't emit too much water when, when it's baking? Well, the thing you have to think about the raw vegetables is that when you're making the filling, um, my dough is already made, so I'm not going to have to wait on the dough. So the, the raw um, greens, once they're chopped, you kind of do want to use them in fairly soon after chopping them, because if you do season them, it becomes like a salad. It will eventually wilt down. And when you're making the jingle of hots with wilted greens, it's a little bit of a messier experience. I'm sure the flavor's still good, but you're going to have liquid that's going to come out in the bread itself. Um, so, so anyway, just a little bit about slicing greens in Armenia. I'll do the cilantro again, but you can, what, what's really cool is that they'll chop it like this, and I don't know if you guys can see that, and then they move their hands, so then they end up chopping the stems and the greens all together. And they can do this with a massive bunch of greens in their hand, which is pretty fun, fun to watch. Um, so we've got greens in there, I'm gonna slice up a couple of these scallions. Now, you had in the book you mentioned that the scallions that they have in Armenia are a lot thinner. So, are they sim more similar to our spring onions or um, just our scallions? 
I, I think in general, and um, those of you who've been to Armenia, I'd love to hear what you think, but I feel that herbs in Armenia um, have a, they, for lack of a better term, like they have a fresher, brighter flavor. Um, there's something about um, a, a, like eating a, a green onion, a scallion in Armenia raw doesn't leave you with that over pungent, like, like kind of flavor in your mouth. So, um, so what I like to think of is uh, if if you do get say a scallion that is really big, I sometimes will just quarter it and serve it if I'm doing an Armenian table, just so you can get the scallion. I might even soak it in water to reduce some of that astringency. But then when it comes to herbs like dill, um, and this is really beautiful dill, sometimes dill in the States can be a little coarse. And dill in Armenia is just so, it's almost sweet. It's got like a freshness and a sweetness. So um, one of the interesting things about Armenian food in general is a lot of people think, oh, it's got to be filled with spices. And it's not. It's really the key ingredient for a lot of this food is the, um, the fresh herbs. So you use a lot of fresh herbs. You never are shy with fresh herbs, um, which I think is, um, for me, going from Burmese food to Italian food, it's, um, it's, it's, it's closer to, say, what I would think of as Southern Italian food than it is to what people might think of as Armenian food in the US or Middle Eastern food in the US. So did you have a question? Or? No, I was just going to say that like growing up in an Armenian household, every night for dinner, there's green onions, even raw onions on the table. Yeah. Because you yeah. just eat it with whatever you're eating. So, there, I mean, Armenians are very used to just eating raw green onion. <laughs> it's true, like a raw green onion. Um, but I do think, like, in Armenia, the, the onions are a little sweeter. You can eat them raw. And there's something really nice about a nice, delicious, raw onion flavor, especially if you have grilled meat. You get your piece of lavash, which I can't believe I've gone this far. And I have a book called Lavash, and I haven't mentioned lavash once, but we'll get there. Um, but let me get on to this uh, filling. So we've got a little um, just vegetable oil. Um, they don't, in the country of Armenia um, and in Artsakh, uh, olive oil is very expensive. So you use sun, um, usually like a sunflower oil. Um, I like using a little red chili flake. The ladies who make this in the Stepana Carrot Bazaar would not be using that probably, but they would use um, they would use some paprika, and then um, I add lemon juice because sometimes I find the greens that you get in the U.S. don't have enough sour flavor, and so you want that sour flavor. In Armenia, they would probably not use the lemon juice; they would just use. There's like a million different ways or, or greens that are called something like sorrel, and they're all a little different. But there's what. Avaluk, Turturuk, Turtenjuk, I can't even get into it, but they all sort of are variations of this, and that gives it like that bright, sour flavor. So we've are got- there, Are there any other American type vegetables that um, offer that kind of sour flavor? Um, I like using, when it comes to greens, I think you can taste greens that sometimes you forget about using, like a Radish tops can sometimes have a sour flavor. Turnip tops, depending on the turnip. There's some lovely turnip tops here that are pretty mild um, and nice. Sometimes they have a sharpness. Um, those can be also used for the, a kind of a sour flavor. And then another way you can get sour is from things like sour cherries, um, pomegranate molasses. Um, and you can use vinegar, too, So for just for that, that sourness. So through the magic of moving. <laughs> I'm going to just scoot this here and um, start rolling out and see if I have luck shaping this jingle of pots. So this is, this is, with a, this is the moment of truth. Um, so I'm just taking this, this ball of dough. As I said, it's very easy to handle dough. Um, you want to keep it nice and floured, um, but it's forgiving. It's a soft dough. I did the other day try to use a very, very local um, uh, milled flour. That was a variety of wheat I hadn't heard of. And I didn't realize that it just wasn't going to work. It totally fell apart on me. So you do want some flour with a bit of um, gluten to hold it together. Um, and if you do want to use a local, locally milled flour, start with maybe a quarter of it in the mixture and then add. So you can have, you can experiment with whole grains and make a delicious version of this. Um, you know, this, this recipe can be a jumping off point for a lot of things. So you've got a nice dough, nothing, nothing too crazy, probably around eight, nine inches. 
In Armenia, they make them really large. I find it's easier at home to get used to a smaller, smaller size so you don't, you feel like you can get some success and like learn how to make the dough. And then you can go crazy and make them real big if you want. So I'm actually going to mound this. Um, more greens than you think are going to fit. And that's also um, part of the thing about this bread. And I think it was one that as soon as we tried it in Armenia, we thought, wow, no matter what we have in this book, we're going to have to have this recipe in. So I'm just going to pinch this. Think of like making a really big dumpling filled with greens. Um, I'm just pinching it down, like maybe, maybe making dumplings or pie crust. Um, and I'm just going to close it. So it doesn't have to be in any particular perfect crimped shape. Um, and I want to thank the Google staff for making such a nice dough <laughs> for me earlier. Um, so look, it's got, I mean, check this out. It's kind of crazy, right? It's this big, puffy, sort of my version, maybe a little misshapen. I'm not as practiced as the women in, um, in Artsakh. Uh, but we've got this ball of dough. And now what I'm going to do, my side of my hand is floured. And I'm just going to smash the bread like that, sealing it. It's got a little air in there. Um, my co-author, Ara, for some reason, even though he grew up in LA, he's a big um, Falcons fan. He calls these deflated footballs. So you know, you can think of it as a deflated football. So um, I'm going to actually, you can do this too to make sure it gets nice and flat. Roll it. Um, like that. And um, again, if there's a little hole, like there's a little hole there, I'm just going to patch it and then maybe roll it again. So jingle of hats, ready for the pan. And that's a thing, too. You can, use, um, you can use a cast iron skillet. This is, I think, a paella pan, that, um, which is beautiful. And if I was faster, I could have had two going at the same time. Um, at home, sometimes I use an overturned wok. That's what I also love to do for um, making lavash. It gets uh, nice and hot. It's like a sage. Um, you get this nice hot surface, but it also cools down fast. So in between, you can turn it off, and it's not going to scorch your next batch of um, dough. But I'm just going to, this probably needs to be a little hotter. I think if I keep holding this button down, it goes to superpower, but I don't know. That might be too hot for me. So <laughs> we'll see. Um, what do you think about the idea of like resourcefulness in our cuisine? Like, I think this dish is a great example of just using everything that you have around you. Um, and I think that's probably a theme. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. It's incredibly resourceful. Um, for instance, this is a bread that is made from greens. Most of them are foraged. So springtime is the time to eat this. You would forage for as many greens as you could find. Um, and to the point where sometimes people had lists of 22 greens. And I'm not even sure off the top of my head I could name 22 greens. <laughs> you know, There's, I said, like a lot of versions of sorrel. Mountain sorrel, meadow sorrel, sorrel from the, the I don't know, the river. Um, but uh, so it's not only resourceful because of the ingredients, but it's resourceful in how they use their kitchen. So no one's going to tell me you have to only use a, a cast iron sage to make your jingle of pots. Use whatever pan um, you, you can. Um, if it's a pancake griddle, if it's an electric griddle, it, it will work. Um, another thing, uh, now it's getting hot. Um, another thing I found, too, is that um, I think in the US we use plastic wrap uh, more than we need to. Um, I know for sustainability issues, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. Um, in Armenia, when I went to a commercial bakery there, um, people use what they have. So um, this wouldn't, this one woman, it, it was cold that morning and she wanted to make sure her dough stayed warm. So she took her winter coat and just draped it <laughs> over the bowl. Um, so, uh, and then another woman, um, we were in her home um, and she was teaching us how to make um, this really amazing type of uh, baklava from the city of Goris. Um, that recipe is in the book too. Um, and to cut, instead of using a new piece of, say, plastic wrap, she would just cut um, plastic bags from something she had used before. And a lot of this, I think, is resourcefulness, but it also goes back to Soviet times where you had to reuse things because, um, and you also had to make um, as much, you had to make a lot of your own food because to guarantee the quality, you wanted to make your own butter, you wanted to make your own pickles. Um, and even today, you can go to um, a modern home in Yerevan and you go into the pantry and they've got it stocked with 
pickles, preserves, um, you know, dried cured meats that they've made. And this is like an apartment, but they're still preserving as if they were still um, on a farm. So it, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, so let's see. I think, I think we need a little bit more heat on this guy. Um, generally, I think maybe three minutes each side, depending on your heat source. Um, today, I, I also discovered that um, if you use a pizza oven, if you're fortunate to have access to a pizza oven and can crank it up to say 700-ish degrees, right, guys? Uh, you can make um, jingle of hot in the the pizza oven um, really nicely. So another option. Um, maybe I'll, I'll roll out another one, and I can keep talking um, and answer any questions. Do we have any audience questions? I don't. Generally, you don't add any fat or oil. No, that's a great question, actually. And um, the first time I made this at home, I said, I'm going to try it with some oil. It's got to make it better, right? And I ended up like splashing the oil onto my arm, and it was a terrible idea. So um, no, you use a dry pan. Um, when you're using cast iron, you want to make sure that pan has already been used seasoned. Um, there's lots of great instructions online for how to season a cast iron pan. I don't know, Ida, if you have special ways of seasoning that you recommend. I don't but. have any special <laughs> ways. I, I do it pretty much the normal way. So um, you can look it up. There's a yeah. great you know, search engine that'll tell you how to season cast iron <laughs> pans. Uh. So, so the, um, the, the thing about it is if the pan is seasoned and it's hot, the dough won't stick. Um, and that's why using a wok that's flipped over, like I do for um, making making lavash, it really works. Um, it really works well because it doesn't stick, and it just the bread instantly puffs up a bit. So um, I believe on Instagram you just recently discovered another yes. cooking. <laughs> so somebody. Um, uh, sent me a photo of they didn't have a wok, they didn't have a cast iron pan, they wanted to do um, lavash on the grill outside, and um, they it was too cold, it was raining, so they brought the grill pan, like a, a, a perforated grill pan, inside on the stove, flipped it over, and actually put the dough on top of this perforated grill pan, and that worked. So, I mean, it, it just kind of opened my eye on how many op like ways you could actually do this. So this still needs a little bit of color, um, but I'm going to flip it over anyway and um, keep it going and then keep an eye on this, um, this burner as I'm getting accustomed to it. I'm going to make one more of these. How to adapt your local greens that you're finding at your market or maybe you're growing in your garden um, to, to this bread. And um, the first thing is, um, what I like to do is I like to have, you can use a lot of different types of greens. I think the, the key is um, Getting a balance. You want um, you want some greens that have flavor that are um, that are a little bit more pungent. So if you don't have sorrel, um, you know save your radish greens from from your radishes and and use those or dandelion greens, which are something that grow all over um, California and are really popular um, uh, for like that bitterness. You could probably even go with um, radicchio for that bitterness. So you want to look for a balance of um, you want herbs, cilantro, cilantro and parsley, cilantro, parsley, dill, a combination like that. Um, woo, now we're cooking. OK, that's what we're looking for. Um, so and then you want neutral herbs. So maybe chard, maybe spinach, maybe um, I, I would say um, kale, of course. Another way to use kale, if you're getting like a CSA and you're just like, I can't do a kale salad anymore, maybe make some bread. OK, so now that I've got the super heat going, um, this, is, this right here is a little bit more of what you're looking for, this, these blisters. So um, maybe the second one will be the magic jingle of hot swear. Another thing about this is that it's, um, it's not a hard project, but it's not a clean project. So you can see I'm probably going to be wearing a lot of flour. Um, but you know, it's fun. It's fun. It's a nice um, rainy day activity. All right, not too much flour there. So another deflated football. There we go. Um, but yeah, great question. Use a lot of, um, if, if you're stuck with greens that you don't know what to do with, um, taste it. See if it's bitter or if it's um, neutral or maybe it's like kind of floral. Um, and then balance it out with something else that's a little bit, um, so you have a range. You get that, like, this the acidity, and you get the herbal flavor, and a little bit of um, green onion, spring onion, 
a shallot, um, maybe even just a little white onion if you don't have green onions. Any of those combinations. I have done this. I think I did a demo in um, New York a few years ago on Jingle of Pots when I was still learning how to make it. And somebody was just like, where's the hot sauce? You know what? Like, you could put some hot sauce in it. I'm not going to stop you. Um, somebody also asked about cheese. Um, I would say I would probably, I would serve it with cheese. I don't know if I'd put the cheese inside because I, it would kind of make a mess of, of the pan if it did start oozing out grilled cheese style. But you could probably make a delicious one like that. It probably wouldn't be jingle of hots, but it would be great, you know. So, um, so that's a great question. Um, I should probably talk a little bit about lavash. <laughs> So um, one of the things is if you did run out of greens, say like uh, you have no more greens and you have extra dough, you could just roll this out and um, into uh, a, un, a very simple version of lavash. But lavash itself um, is a really special bread. It's the reason we called the book lavash was um, it's the center of every meal. There's lavash on every table in Armenia. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's a bowl of lavash. Um, and I've made the mistake. Sometimes I call it lavash, but then it's lavash. Like, you guys have, you know, I, I should say, um, I've now said it um, lavash enough times. And we did a book talk in LA, and they said, can you please tell people to pronounce it lavash? And I said, you know, we just want people to know about the bread. Call it however you want. But, um, but they, they usually do say lavash. And it's a, um, a UNESCO heritage um, bread. It's recognized as a, a part of intangible cultural heritage for Armenia. So um, to say it's important is probably an understatement. It's just, um, it's a beautiful bread. Um, it's made in a clay tonier in the oven, about four feet deep. And to watch women, where it's usually always women working around the tonier, um, they're like professional baseball players. So one of them is like rolling the dough. One of Then she throws it to the next woman, who's then, she's rolling it out into a sheet, and she tosses it to the next woman, who's maybe like the batter, and she stretches it over this. Um, it's, it would be the equivalent of a pizza peel. They call it like a batat. It looks like a really firm pillow. And it looks like a pillow you would never want to use for sleeping, but it's great for stretching dough over. And then they take it, and they slap it against the hot oven um, wall, and it immediately puffs. And then this, the fourth woman, she gets a hook, and she kind of takes it out of the oven, and then makes sure it cooks on the other side for a few seconds, and then stacks it in a pile. So it really is watching the orchestration. Um, it, it's, it's, it's spectacular. And to us, it was worth going to Armenia to see what it was like in person. Um, so it's for our recipe in our book, obviously, we weren't going to have people um, make uh, a tonier in their backyard. So we had to get a little bit um, creative on, um, let's see, what kind of heat sources would get hot enough that you would get the effect of a very hot oven, um, but then also be able to make it in an apartment or in um, a, a, a stove if you, don't, if you didn't have a gas stove. Like, so we kind of gave it in the book. We have options for using a griddle, um, using a pancake griddle, using, um, using your uh, grill if you, if you wanted to use a grill. Um, so just alternatives. It's not going to be tonier lavash, but it's going to be a delicious flatbread that you can feel satisfied that you can make at home. So, oh, now that's that's more like it. So this one, number two. So think of it like I think flatbreads. They're kind of like um, the first pancake. You know, like sometimes the first pancake you're still figuring out the surface, and the second pancake you kind of get you get it. Yeah. So now I think. Um, I'll move into beans. Yeah. So speaking of beans, I just want to point out for those of you um, who did get the book and for those of you who didn't, please look this way. I just learned that this gorgeous photo is um, the, the city to which these beans came, uh, recipe came from, right? Right. So the very first um, thing you'll see when you open up the book is this picture of what kind of looks like a storybook, like a castle. And, um, and it's, it's this beautiful photo. Um, John shot it um, in 2015 with the students from TUMO. And um, it's, it's remarkable. You can actually take a gondola ride to go see it. Um, it's called Tatev Monastery. And culinarily wise, why it's interesting is um, 
This area is near the city of Goris, and Goris is famous for its beans. Um, they make beans. Uh, the beans are a little bit like cranberry beans or burlati beans, um, which, if you guys haven't seen those um, raw, they have speckles on them. They're almost like a raw pinto bean. Um, but in Goris, they come in like so many different colors. You, you have pur deep purple ones. You have magenta ones. Um, and you just have this range. And the women are really passionate about which village outside of Goris has um, has the best beans. And, so, and the women in Goris have strong Armenian accents, and they like to talk all at once. So we learned a lot, but I don't know if we learned anything. We just know that there's a lot of great beans um, there. But when we visited Tatev, um, we just needed time for like a little snack before um, continuing. All right, before I burn down the house. All right. Um, we need a, um, we went to a little roadside stand next to the monastery and um, we ordered some beans actually and the beans were really good, good enough where we're just like we need to find a woman um, in Goris who could help us learn how to make the beans and um, excuse my mess, I'm really usually a very clean, clean, um, clean cook but um, right now I'm just slicing up a little bit of onion. Um, if you want, you can slice it into smaller pieces. It's, it's not really all that important. Um, so Goris is known for its, its beans, but it's also, um, it's also just a really uh, fascinating place to, to visit for the Tatev Monastery. And also, it's a, it's a beautiful city that kind of has gotten forgotten about. Um, and we found this woman through friends of a friend who invited us into her home. and. She, she really didn't want anything from us. She just invited us over and we're saying, what, what, what can we bring? She's like, nothing, just, you know, just bring yourselves. And they said, can we, we just want to learn more about Gori beans because we know that they're, they're so delicious. So right now, this is just um, a saute pan or a, a saucepan. I'm going to put a little bit of the, um, the vegetable oil in it. Um, you can use sunflower oil. You can use olive oil. It takes it in a different flavor profile that isn't as true to... Um, to Armenia, but could be true to a lot of uh, different cultures. Um, so back to the, the woman in Goris, like she invites us over, and we thought she was going to show us maybe like one dish, two dishes, how to cook beans. She made about five different dishes with Goris beans. Like she just kept making bean dish after bean dish after bean dish, starting with this really simple one um, that I'm showing you right now. Um, and all this is, is I'm going to saute some onion in some oil, add the beans to it, a little salt, and some of the, um, the bean cooking water. Um, and it's going to sort of turn into the Armenian equivalent of refried beans. I'm going to mash the beans a little bit. Um, and to me, this is like a great, delicious side dish. You finish it with just some fresh herbs. Um, you can add a little chili if you want. So you don't have to. Um, and it's, it's kind of a way that it's a starting point. So you can serve this. Um, you can decide not to mash the beans and serve it as a, as a room temperature salad. You can mash the beans and have it as a side dish. You can mash the beans and then make it as a filling for what we have in the book are these like lavash triangles, which this woman showed us. She just started, as I said, making bean dish after bean dish. Um, and she, you wrap um, almost like a shape of a samosa, the beans and strips of lavash. And then she, she would just fry it on the stove. Um, it also works well to bake it. Um, she made a bean soup for us. She made a bean. The, the craziest thing was at one point in the, in the afternoon, she got out her meat grinder and sent the beans through the meat grinder and made like this bean pate, which I think was like a Soviet kind of style of maybe like, oh, this is pate, but it's with beans. So as I said, there was like, wow, we, we thought we could have a whole bean chapter, but we ran out of space in the book. We had to had to pick which ones. But like I said, this can be a really great um, starting point for just a range of different, different dishes. Um, a little bit about cooking onion. Um, a lot of recipes say to caramelize onions, and that usually, if you want to caramelize them property, properly, it's about a 20 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute kind of ordeal. So I'm not going for caramelization. I just want the onions softened and cooked, but not with, not with much color, if that makes sense. Yeah, sweated. Yeah, so you can see right here they're just they're just sweating. You know, they're just kind of um, doing their thing. But um, so if you 
really wanted to have a very healthy meal, complete meal. You have your jingle of hots, you have some goris beans, and goris and where jingle of hots are from, art soccer, are actually very, relatively speaking, they're not that far away from each other. Um, we actually stopped at Goris before going to Stefana Kert, which is the capital of Artsakh. And it's hard to explain Armenia without having a map in back of me. But um, just to get the, um, just to get where it is in the world, um, Armenia has borders with Georgia, um, Iran, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. And right in the center, there's an area called the Republic of Artsakh. It's also called Nagorno-Karabakh. It's a conflict zone. Um, it's it. It's a, a complicated area, but it's ethnically Armenian. Um, yes, and we have a little map of like where we went. <laughs> so, um, and, and Artsakh is right in this area here. So it's not technically part of Armenia, but the roads, there's two roads in and out. They both go through Armenia, um, and they were built, uh, probably funded, at least half of it was funded by the um, Armenian diaspora. So um, it's, it's one of those places you kind of feel like you're in Brigadoon. You're in the middle of nowhere, and then you drive, and then all of a sudden there's this, this city um, that makes delicious flatbreads, as we know. So um, now these are nice and sweated. I'm just going to add, I'm not going to add all these beans, just enough to give you a sense of um, ooh, some salt. And then, you know, if you're using, you can do canned beans with this. If you're using canned beans, um, I taste them first. Some canned beans are saltier than others. And then um, you just kind of give them a mash. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, if you wanted these really luscious, you could really go um, heavier on um, the oil. When I used to work at a restaurant in San Francisco called A16, we had um, cannellini beans made in a very similar way. <laughs> And we used so much oil. I think there was enough olive oil per bean. Um, they were pretty decadent, but they were delicious. Um, so I'm, I'm using a fish spatula to smash this. You don't have to. Oh, because there's a potato masher right in front of me, and I just didn't see it. Um, but it doesn't really matter exactly how textured this is. I like a little bit more texture. You can make this smooth. And then just kind of simmer it with the, the bean cooking liquid so it gets um, it gets like kind of absorbs those flavors and gets nice and soft. Um, and like I said, this is something super easy to make. And then to dress it up, you get your, your greens. So now I'll demonstrate the way they, they do it in Armenia, where they take like a big bouquet of greens like this, maybe chop off the ends. And then they chop the middle side, go like this. And then from there, they kind of just go down. So you get, it's a really great use of time because you're cutting a lot of herbs at once and you're having a perfect mix of herbs all ready to go. And um, I don't know if you guys saw this when you went to Armenia, but you can buy bouquets of herbs ready to go for your food. So instead of having to buy the cilantro separately from the parsley, from the um, purple basil, you buy this beautiful bouquet and it has the parsley, the cilantro, the dill, the purple basil, all in like a bouquet. And you just take that and they just chop right through. And it's like pretty much on every single dish, if you want to taste, make it taste like the food of Armenia, you add some fresh herbs. <laughs> that was like our running joke writing this book. Like, how do we finish this recipe? Yeah, fresh herbs. Fresh herbs. <laughs> yeah. So. Do we have any questions? Okay. Um, so, Kate. Since this is California and we have ample vegetables, but I don't know how safe it is to go foraging, per se, um, what would you suggest for those who might have a, an outdoor garden or even oh. a patio garden to grow? If you can grow sorrel, I, I feel um, sorrel is uh, something that I think in this climate go, grows pretty, um, pretty easily. And sorrel, because it has that natural lemon flavor inside, it's a delicious green to use if if you wanted to just make your pesto a little bit more interesting, add a bit of sorrel leaves and you get that brightness. Um, sorrel does have a tendency to turn brown when you cook it, but I think if I had a pot of sorrel, if I was smart enough to plan ahead and have a pot of sorrel or have it growing wild in my backyard, I would be a very happy cook right now. To the point I tried to buy some at the farmer's market this past weekend and the chefs had already bought all the sorrel. 
<laughs> so if you want to know what's next, make your, grow some sorrel. Maybe you can sell it to some chef friends. Um, I would say um, always it's easy to buy cilantro and parsley. So it's, you can grow it, but it's not like as much as, as interesting. Um, but I, I would say um, any, any kind of tender green that you can grow that, grows, that can maybe grow well in your climate, you can um, use that in so many different parts of Armenian food. Um, we have um, beet green soup. Beet greens are very popular. Um, you can use beet greens in the jingle of hots in a soup or wilt them down and make a salad that wouldn't be a traditional raw green salad, but just like a, greens that are quickly wilted, um, maybe tossed with a little bit of vinaigrette, finish it with a, a mix of garlic and yogurt, and then um, some pomegranate seeds on top. You could have a salad. So it's not necessarily a raw green salad, but it acts like a salad. It's a nice vegetable um, green dish. So I would say any kind of... Um, Charred kale if those grow well for you, um, but the secret would be, yeah, figure out, figure out your sorrel. <laughs> the difference between Armenian American um, food and culture and what I saw in Armenia, the country, um, the differences are pretty profound, um, and I, I think you would agree that uh, the the food in um, Armenia, the country, to just put it in a context, there's maybe three million people who live in the country of Armenian. Uh, Armenia, and there's 8 million diaspora Armenians. So there's more Armenians that live outside of Armenia than in Armenia. And the ones who live in Armenia also have Soviet heritage, Soviet food traditions that Armenians who either grew up in California, France, Lebanon, um, Syria, elsewhere, they never were exposed to. And another thing was um, Armenian culture kind of goes back um, Armenia used to be a much bigger country, um, and then several centuries ago, there was the part that was controlled by the Persian Shahs and the part that was controlled by the, um, the Ottomans. And both of those food traditions also kind of intersected in ways. So after the, um, the Armenian genocide, which started in 1915, there was a mass migration, and I mean, 1.5 million Armenians um, and other ethnicities were, were killed. Um, and what ended up happening after that is there was a mass migration out to other parts, like Fresno, um, for instance, um, France. And um, they brought their food cultures, but the food cultures were already different from the food cultures that were evolving around where Yerevan is today. That area is mountainous. Um, there's no ocean. There's not much of a spice um, usage. Whereas if you were an Armenian who was in what is present state Turkey, you had a lot of spices. Um, you had a lot of lemon juice. You might have used olive oil. So the food traditions that you ended up moving to Glendale or to Fresno were already quite different. So when I went to Armenia, it was sort of like, where's, oh, oh, so Lakhmajun is an interesting story. It's a flatbread um, topped with ground meat and seasoning. Um, that's something that in Armenia today, they think of that as like a newer food, even though for me, I always thought of it as Armenian pizza. <laughs> so, um, so I thought that was kind of an example of sometimes you think you know something and you go and you're just thinking, wow, this goes back so much deeper. Um, and it makes the history of that area so much deeper. To You kind of have to dig down to learn about it before you can kind of understand why is sour cream so much more prevalent? Why are beets and potatoes so, so common in Armenia? It's like, well, you know, Soviet time. This, the foods there are going to be different than they were if you had um, you were Armenian coming from, from Istanbul. So uh, the long-winded question, um, but it's an important one to address for sure. So um, these beans are looking, I don't know if you guys can see, they look pretty nice. See how creamy they are? Um, they're... The, the bean cooking liquid, if you don't, if you're using canned beans, you can also use water. Um, but the cooking liquid does give it this nice creaminess. Um, and just to finish it, you really just, that's all you need. Just some fresh herbs. And it's incredible how the fresh herbs can lift the flavor and give it so much more dimension. I probably need to add more salt. Um, if you're more of a Western Armenian, you would definitely add um, maybe Aleppo pepper to this. Um, the Eastern Armenians would be like, I don't know, this may be too spicy for me. I'll stick with some paprika. So, you would add the I, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could definitely. Oh, oh, yeah. So let me make a beautiful spread because I have made such a mess up here. Um, so, I'm just going to um, slice this. So, okay, to slice some um, jingle of pots. 
just going to slice it into these little panels. Um, you can eat it, roll it up and eat it like this. So um, you can see, though, the greens. It's all about the greens. And then you have the thin crust on the outside. Um, so just going to stack those nicely there. Um, you can also just wrap it up, eat it, and take it to go <laughs> if you want, um, which is usually how I end up eating it the most often. And then what I'm going to do is put these beautiful beans just on the side. This is not the way they would probably serve it in Armenia, but I think, I think for here, for, for my purposes, how I eat, um, I would be very, very happy with a meal like this. Um, and maybe, of course, always top it with more herbs and um, maybe some chili flakes because we are in California and hot sauce makes everything better for many of us. <laughs> so, um, and with that, just a quick mention on these beautiful pickles. Um, pickles are always on the table in um, Armenia too, and they could either be uh, salt brine uh, fermented pickles or vinegar based pickles. And the pickles we have today um, over right here are um, just a, a nice uh, vinegar pickle um, with apple cider vinegar, water, a little bit of dill, um, some black pepper, and super simple pickle. So I want to thank everybody so much for, for taking time to listen to me yap about Jingle of Hots in Armenia. And thank you so much.